want to welcome all of you. It's wonderful to have you here. It's exciting to see how the chairs are filling up. I didn't know how many to put out, but I think it's sort of perfect. Um, I want to welcome you all to this 76th anniversary of the observance of the bombing of Hiroshima. And uh, you know, uh, most of you have been here before, that we've been doing this for many years. And it's because Ashland is a city uh, uh, that is a member of the International Mayors for Peace. Uh, over, there are over 8,000 different city members and about 167 different countries involved in Mayors for Peace. And also, uh, we are a nuclear-free zone. And Peace House, uh, one of the sponsors of this event, was involved in becoming uh, Ashland, becoming a nuclear free zone. Uh, when we started as an organization, that was the main passion, was the focus on nuclear issues, uh, nuclear war, and the prevention of it. So uh, thank you for being here to keep observing this event and for promoting peace in the world. Um, I want to thank uh, some of the other organizers, David Wick from Ashland Culture of Peace and Herb Rothschild, who couldn't be here who uh, is uh, one of the main organizers from South Mountain Friends Quaker Meeting, and uh, then Peace House and One Sunny Day Initiatives, which is Peter Kotomura's organization. So we are all indebted to those who have contributed. And I want to welcome, in particular, Hideko today. Hideko has been a, a, a central force in keeping the awareness of the issues of nuclear war uh, uh, in our thoughts because 76 years ago as a child she suffered uh, the experience of surviving a nuclear war in Hiroshima and she's been able to raise our consciousness and to uh, cheer us on so thank you Hideko, thank you. I also want to thank um, Betty LeDuc because she's provided this marvelous graphic that we use often uh, with our uh, promotional materials. And Betty has been to Hiroshima, and this artwork was inspired uh, by that experience as well as her passion for peace. Thank you, Betty. Um, we're going to have the lighting of the memorial flame now, and that will be done by David Wick from the Ashen Culture Peace. And that will be followed by a letter from the mayor of Hiroshima that will be read by Estelle Fuller. May peace prevail on earth. Good morning. I'm privileged to be able to read this greeting from the mayor of Hiroshima to us here in Ashland. Uh, Hideko requested this letter months ago when we thought we would be able to dedicate one of our green legacy Hiroshima trees that was germinated from a seed of a tree that survived the atomic bombing. It's planted at SOU, but we were, we're not able to dedicate it publicly yet. So uh, there'll be a mention of that. Greetings from the mayor of Hiroshima. It is an honor and a pleasure to send this message on the occasion of the 76th Hiroshima Memorial Vigil. On August 6, 1945, a single atomic bomb destroyed our city claiming countless innocent civilian lives. Having experienced the tragedy of the bombing, Hiroshima continuously appeals for a peaceful world without nuclear weapons, based on the ardent will of the Habaksha, 
No one else should suffer as we have. However, looking at the global situation surrounding nuclear weapons, more than 13,000 nuclear weapons still exist today, with nuclear weapon states increasing and modernizing their nuclear arsenal instead of fulfilling their obligations to pursue negotiations in good faith for nuclear disarmament as stipulated in the Article 6 of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. As humanity continues to face its newest threat, COVID-19, the world has come together to tackle the virus, proof that we are capable of responding to this threat. I believe that the people of the world will be able to overcome the threat posed to humankind by nuclear weapons in much the same way, by working together under common principles and remaining steadfast in our opposition. As the number of people who can speak of the horrors of these weapons from experience declines, it is increasingly important to pass their earnest will for peace on to the next generation, establish as a shared value in civil society the idea that nuclear weapons and war should not exist, and make every effort towards realizing lasting world peace. The Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty which went into effect in 1970, and the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, which entered into force in January of 2021, are both critical to the elimination of nuclear weapons. Even though they comprise a framework that we must pass on to future generations, their future is yet opaque. In order for world leaders to strengthen their determination to ensure this framework functions effectively, it is vital that we create an environment that steers them towards transforming policy. We must continue to raise awareness of peace in civil society so that we may generate momentum towards peace and nurture international public opinion for nuclear abolition. It is therefore, it therefore could not be more meaningful that you have organized the Hiroshima Memorial Vigil to call for a peaceful world free of nuclear weapons. And I extend to you my deepest respect. Together with more than 8,000 Mayors for Peace member cities from 165 countries and regions, the city of Hiroshima intends to create an environment that encourages world leaders to take steps towards nuclear abolition. I would like to ask all of you to act in solidarity with us as we strive to eliminate the absolute evil that is nuclear weapons and realize lasting world peace. In closing, I extend my sincere appreciation to Dr. Michael Oxendine for his great efforts in planting the second generation tree of an atomic bomb survivor tree at Southern Oregon University, as well as offer my best wishes for the great success of this event. August 6, 2021, Kazumi Matsui, Mayor, the City of Hiroshima. Now I would like to invite uh, Dr. Rudd Strobel to come up and he will give a, uh, an invocation, a prayer, and also a reflection. And when it's 8.15, we will be sounding the gong. Yeah, it may be in the middle of what he has to say, but that's the exact time that we want to remember that the bomb hit Hiroshima. My name is Brett Strobel and I am uh, one of the pastors at Ashland First United Methodist Church, and I'm honored uh, to be here once again to speak with you some of my thoughts on what we're doing here today. So let's take a moment and bow our heads in silence.
Gracious and holy God, creator, sustainer, we come together to be a voice of peace, a voice of conscience. Lord, give our voice volume. Amen. I'm honored to be uh, asked to speak again today at uh, the commemoration. I believe, like I said in my invocation, that we are here as a voice of conscience to the world to say never again. The cynic in me, though, thinks that this voice is heard, but with a caveat. And that caveat is unless. Nations have been using that, that fail-safe posture, that word, as they've increased the number of nuclear weapons amounting into the thousands. It is as though the unimaginable suffering of the devastating outcome of a single nuclear bomb has been blurred, nullified, and reduced to that awful and humane, inhumane euphemism called collateral damage. Events like today place a face on a faceless statistic. Innocents murdered by military acts are not collateral damage. They are human beings who have families, who have, have friends and communities. They have lives and loves and hopes, mistakes and regrets. This reality cannot be obfuscated with semantics. Each person has an equal and sacred right to live on the face of the earth. Yet that can be obliterated in a flash, like it happened 76 years ago today, when approximately 70 to 80,000 people were killed in a matter of seconds, when the United States dropped its first nuclear bomb. And its second on Nagasaki three days later. The death toll for both these bombings is about 226,000 people. And then we have the lingering suffering that's happening. 92% of those people were civilians. Okay. I invite you to enter into a moment of silence. Amen. Anybody ever read Immanuel Kant? Immanuel Kant, you, okay, you have? Good, congratulations, well done. <laughs> Immanuel Kant wrote uh, that no peace shall be considered valid if it's made with a covert reservation of the material for a future war. This is not peace, he says. This is a hiatus of hostility. And I think, well, the frightening thought is that we're still in a hiatus and not a genuine peace because we have prepared ourselves for another nuclear conflict. The Federation of American Scientists estimate that there are approximately 
13,100 nuclear weapons possessed by the world's nations. 91% of those are owned by the United States and Russia. And it gives a very sober meaning to the phrase overkill. Our scientific and, and technological advances along with the number of weapons produced have the potential to exact exponential devastation. No person, no group, no nation should have this type of power in, even in the best of times, let alone in times of paranoia and incredulity. That's why today is important. That's why your presence here is a vital part of the pursuit of a perpetual peace. This year's theme is sign the treaty. And I have to make a disclaimer. I am not well versed in the latest talks happening with Iran and its specifics. I'm glad the nations are back together at the table working hard to reestablish an agreement. And I don't envy the work before them, not because of the intricacies of the content and structure, but because of the damage to the foundation when the then president in 2018 withdrew from the agreement and broke faith with the world. That foundation I'm referring to is the underpinning of every agreement, every deal, every treaty. It's the foundation of trust. I think this is going to be the hardest to rebuild. Immanuel Kant wrote this very, very insightful uh, essay called Perpetual Peace. And in it he says, for it must still remain possible, even in times of conflict, to have some sort of trust in the attitude of the adversary. Otherwise, peace could not be concluded, and the hostilities would turn into a war of extermination, in which both parties and right itself might all be simultaneously annihilated, or annihilated which, would allow, which would allow perpetual peace only on the vast graveyard of the human race. That principle of trust had captured my imagination. So, I'd like to indulge in a moment of what some folks might call naivete or foolishness. I hope that's okay. Here I go anyway. I believe that human relationships, at, at least the relationships that flourish and, and foster well-being, the basis of all of that is trust. Trust assumes a, that a generous portion of nature is predictable and, and that companion beings are dependable. And I doubt that human societies, groups, cohorts, or families would really be able to survive without it. It establishes an internal equilibrium of social systems. It is there in the simplest of human interaction. For instance, when you go into a restaurant, I assume most of us have had that happen. We went into a restaurant for a meal and you trust that the waiter is going to seat you at a table that won't tip over or at a chair that won't collapse when you sit in it. You trust that a cook won't poison your food or that the weight person won't pour that food onto your lap. You trust that the bill will reflect the prices of the menu. It's a very simple human interaction, but there's a lot of trust in it. 
trust forms the baseline that enables us to recognize when it's broken, when a lie is spoken, when there are grounds for wariness and suspicion. When someone says, be cautious, consider, consider the phrase behind that word, cautious or caution. That phrase is, can I trust? Can I trust this situation? Can I trust this deal? Can I trust this person? Even wariness is a movement towards trust. Trust empowers us to get up in the morning. It, it empowers us to engage the world. And it's a nobler part of our nature. Trust is something that the various religions commend very highly. In the Jewish tradition, the 40-year exodus was a period of time when Israel and God learned to trust each other. Indeed, the daily sustenance of the manna was a symbol and act of their trust in the grace and providence of God. In the Muslim tradition, Submission is an act of trust to the most merciful and compassionate Allah. In the Christian tradition, the embrace of Jesus is essentially an act of trust. The wisdom of the various spiritual traditions say that trust feeds our souls and settles our anxieties. Trust gives us the spiritual stability to deal with uncertainty and with change. Trust gives us a sense of benign presence during the loneliest or emptiest of times. Now, I doubt the world religions would have made such a big deal of it for thousands of years if it were not essential to the condition, human condition of well-being and, and, and prosperity. That is so often the case, there's a chasm between the ought and the is. We are living in times of endemic distrust. There is distrust in leading pub our leading public servants, in scientists and physicians and epidemiologists. There is distrust in our corporations and judicial systems. There is distrust in international ventures of cooperation. There is distrust in the systemic fabric of our society. There is distrust between ethnic groups, between people. And the really sad point is, there are valid and sound reasons for this distrust. And I sometimes wonder if the distrust is at the root of the existential angst the world is feeling these days. I don't know the answer to this. I don't know the answer. But I think what we're doing today is a step in the right direction. Today we are calling the world to remember the nobler parts of ourselves. Events like today nurture a vision of a day when trust takes center stage, when we are not only, not only trust, but we're also trustworthy, which is something we do have control of. Now, I'd like to leave you with a vision that well, it's a vision that I think are worth our energies to strive for. And it's from the prophet Micah with a little bit of my own interpretive translation. The days to come, 
The mountain of the Holy Trust shall be established as the highest of mountains. It shall be raised up above the hills. People shall stream to it. And many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the trust of the God of Jacob, that we may be taught the holy ways, and that we may walk its sacred path. Peace shall judge between peoples. Shalom shall arbitrate between strong nations far away. And they will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they study war any more. But they shall sit under their own vines and under their own fig trees, and no one shall make them afraid. For the mouth of the trustworthy one has spoken. Thank you. Thank you for your trust and graciousness in letting me speak today. Now I'd like to introduce Ashland City Councilor Sean Moran, and he's going to read the Ashland Mayoral Proclamation for this year, uh, affirming the intentions of uh, the city of Ashland to have peace. Thank you, Elizabeth. Can everyone hear me? Our town's waking up, so it's getting a little bit noisier. Um, listen, before I, uh, I begin, I'd just like to introduce myself. My name is Sean Moran. Uh, it's my honor uh, to be asked by Elizabeth uh, to come speak to you this morning. Uh, I'd like to say thank you to the Peace House and everyone else who put this uh, event together. Um, as a side note, uh, many of you don't know that before I moved with my family to Ashland in 2009, I had lived nearly half my life in Japan. Uh, Japan is like a second home to me. Um, on business, I had been to Hiroshima many, many times. Um, and I, um, I take this, um, this opportunity uh, today to speak to you um, uh, humbly, and I appreciate uh, being asked. So with that, I will read the 2021 Ashland Proclamation. Nuclear weapons are the most devastating weapons ever created by humankind, posing an intolerable risk to human survival. The threat of their use is increasing. Ashland's public commitment to end the threat of nuclear catastrophe dates back to 1982, when its citizens passed a ballot measure declaring the city a nuclear-free zone. Ashland became a mayor's for peace city in 1998, responding to a global invitation from the mayors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki to work for the abolition of nuclear weapons. There are currently 8,037 mayors of peace cities in 165 nations and regions, including 218 in the United States and seven in Oregon. Mayors for Peace enthusiastically support the new treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons adopted in July uh, 2017 under United Nations auspices. It, earned, it entered into force January 22nd that year and is legally and legally binding on the 54 governors who have ratified it thus far. In June 2019, the Oregon Legislature passed Senate Joint Memorial 5, calling on the President and Congress to lead global efforts to reduce the threat of nuclear war. On June 20th, the U.S. Conference of Mayors adopted its 16th consecutive annual resolution urging the President and Congress to provide leadership to prevent nuclear war and enter in negotiations to eliminate all nuclear weapons. The U.S. Conference of Mayors resolution calls for reconceptualized interest in human-centered security, a redirection of funds that are currently allocated to nuclear weapons, and unwarranted military spending, support for safe and resilient cities to meet human needs, it urges support for the UN Secretary General, General's call for immediate global ceasefire, helping the world community to address the COVID-19 pandemic. During August 6th through August 9th, concerned citizens from civil organizations and faith communities in Ashland and the Rogue Valley 
will commemorate the atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and renew our commitment to prevent such weapons from ever being used again. Now, therefore, the city council, the mayor, on behalf of the citizens of Ashland, hereby proclaim August 6th as Hiroshima Day, and, thereby proclaim, and hereby proclaim August 9th, 2021 as Nagasaki Day. In the city of Ashland, and invite all citizens to participate in the Hiroshima Nagasaki Vigil Activities, signed this day of August 6, 2021. Thank you. Thank you, Sean, for that. I'm going to introduce now someone that almost everyone here will know, and that is Dr. Michael Neiman, a retired professor from SOU and professor of international studies, among other things. And um, he's going to talk to us now about the history of a uh, nuclear treaty and uh, related subjects. Thank you, Elizabeth, and thank you all for coming to this very important event. And I'm glad to see so many faces here. And I'm hoping very much that next year there will be even more faces. I'm going to give you a quick update on the status of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, which is a crucial treaty, a crucial document that will, I think, play a major role in the eventual abolition of nuclear weapons worldwide. As several people have already mentioned, the difference between this observation today and last year's observation of the Hiroshima Day is the fact that the treaty is now in force. On January 21st, 2021, the 50th country ratified the treaty, and so that means it is now an actual international legally binding document, and that is very, very important. Since then, there are four more uh, ratifications. So today, the status is 86 states have signed the treaty, and 55 has ra have ratified it. What does it mean when a treaty enters into force? That means that the paragraphs, the, specific, the specifications, the provisions of that treaty are now legally binding on those countries who have ratified it. Now, of course, the nuclear weapon state have not ratified this treaty, so therefore they are not yet bound by its provisions. But, and this is the important aspect to keep in mind, every treaty contains a number of provisions and uh, that lead to the establishment of guidelines, regulations, rules, etc. And these get to be established once the treaty is in force. So in order to get that process rolling, uh, the Secretary General of the United Nations in April invited those countries who have ratified the treaty to come to the very first meeting of the state's parties, and that will take place January 12th through 14th in Vienna, Austria. So those countries that have actually ratified the treaty will meet in Vienna, Austria next January. And what will they do there? Well, first of all, they will start implementing the provisions of the treaty, because in addition to the abolition of nuclear weapons, the treaty also envisions uh, reparations to the victims of nuclear war and nuclear testing, as well as the remediation of environmental damage caused by the nuclear testing that led to the uh, development of nuclear weapons. So those provisions can already be implemented. And that's what is going to be a topic of discussion in January next year. In addition to that, the countries will lay out the guidelines and the timelines and specifications of what has to happen when a nuclear weapon state uh, decides to join the treaty. In other words, once a country that has nuclear weapons ratifies the treaty, there has to be a timeline uh, according to which that country will abolish its nuclear weapons. There has to be a verification mechanism to make sure that these weapons have actually been abolished. And all of those guidelines and rules and regulations will be developed by the states that have ratified the treaty. And that process will start next January. So after five years of hoping and wishing that we would have finally an international document that prohibits nuclear weapons. 
what we are now entering into is the phase of implementing that treaty, of creating the frameworks that allow the process of uh, abolishing nuclear weapons to proceed. And I think that's a major step forward, and so I think it's a cause for celebration as well. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael, for those uh, insightful comments contextualizing where we are and where we need to go. It's really this ceremony, as well as everything that Michael just outlined, uh, really is a statement about intention. And so uh, it's, it's helpful for us to know the worldwide intention of so many countries uh, at the same time that we're celebrating on a similar level, but I'm much smaller here in our community. I'd like to now introduce uh, David Wick. Uh, he's no stranger to anyone here, really. Um, but uh, he's going to get, read a letter from the Hiroshima uh, representative for the movement called May, May Peace Prevail on Earth. Thank you, Elizabeth, and all those who have organized today. A very important part of our community but this community reaches internationally. Yesterday at 3 o'clock in the afternoon was 8 o'clock in Japan on August 6th. There's a ceremony at the Peace Park in Hiroshima at that time. There's a two-hour ceremony that was taking place. It was live streamed internationally. This is from one of the organizers of that event, a message to us here in Ashland. The Ashland Peace Flame, which is at the Falden Pavilion, was highlighted in a video during this ceremony, which streamed internationally. Message from Hiroshima about the Hiroshima World Peace flag ceremony. Hello everyone in Ashland. My name is Toshia Tomaninga and I live in Hiroshima, Japan. Today I am very pleased to have the opportunity to send a message from thousands of miles away. Every year on August 6th our group holds the annual World Peace Flag Ceremony to pray for peace around the world on the anniversary of the atomic bomb. This year marks the 29th year to do so. It is a very simple ceremony to pray for peace in each country by raising the national flags of each nation regardless of race, religion, or politics. The ceremony has been held annually in front of the atomic bomb dome, which has become a symbol and a wish for everlasting peace. That was the ground zero in Hiroshima. The atomic bomb detonated above it, and the dome and the structure part of it still stands. And that is a symbol of Hiroshima and the, the uh, ongoing wish for peace. Unfortunately, due to the influence of the new coronavirus, we could not hold the event in person last year or this year, instead, we learned how to use Zoom with the support of many people. We were able to send our prayers for peace in a surprisingly wide range online. Our online event was just presented yesterday, which was August 6th in Japan. Although we could not actually raise the flags in person at the Hiroshima Peace Park for the past two years, now during the online events, we use photographs of people who participated in previous years in the form of a slideshow. Our colleagues became voice leaders. In this way, we could pray with people all over the world through the internet. In the process, we realized that the expressions of every flag bearer's face was beautiful and precious. We learned through these photographs that Hiroshima is gifted with the power and the spirit to be able to offer our prayers for peace in each country, regardless of race, religion, politics, or differences, and at the same time, it is Hiroshima's mission to do so. We wish and pray that, and 
we wish and pray, may peace prevail on earth, is not limited to Hiroshima on August 6th. It is the essential wish of mankind at all times and everywhere. I am very impressed to learn that even in the United States, the whole city is praying for peace on August 6th. Today, we would like to pray for world peace with you. Thank you very much. May peace prevail on earth. Versailles, Tomininga. At the conclusion of the program yesterday, they had a woman singing with the dome, a live stream of the dome in the Hiroshima Park and the central image picture of, of Ashland, the world peace flame in Ashland, was right there next to the dome. Quite a statement. Thank you very much. We're going to have some music now. And uh, after some period of reflection, I invite you, if you want to, to participate in the water ceremony. The water ceremony, as it says on your program, is a, a way of uh, expressing prayers for the departed who have been affected by nuclear war or by nuclear contamination uh, in the world. The idea is that the rock will represent uh, the souls of those people and that we will be pouring a ladle of water over the rock and saying our private prayers uh, in terms of honoring those who have died and remembering them uh, in our lives.
to ask Dr. Strobel to come and give us a final blessing. Thank you. Great spirit and gracious leader and creator, may what we do here today, what we share and remember, be sincere and resolute. May we have the vision and the trust to not only make a difference in the world, but to make our world different. Different from the pain, the prejudice, the fear, the malice, the indifference that seems so endemic. Make us, sacred spirit, instruments of trust and peace. Thank you all for coming. Please go in peace. <laughs>